Um, so as I move into uh, to the talk uh, about my book, Disconnected, I want to just say a word or two. Um, Lonnie shared my bio, but I want to say a couple of other words about how I come to this work, how I've come to look at uh, young people's digital lives and the influence they're having on their moral and ethical sensibilities. So first I want to say I'm a sociologist by training, um, and being a sociologist, I'm really um, forever interested in how social contexts um, and experiences. Sorry, I just want to make sure people can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. People in the back? People? Up? Good. Thumbs up. All right. Um, so I'm forever interested in how social contexts and structures really form our beliefs, our values, and our life choices. And I think the digital context is a relatively new context in which um, we're seeing some really interesting changes and implications for the way we look at our world. So um, I come to this work with the hat of a sociologist, but also I've been working for a little over 11 years at a research center at the Harvard Graduate School of Education called Project Zero, um, where I've been spending time with psychologists like Howard Gardner and other education researchers who for many years, Project Zero has been around for almost 50 years now, um, and a lot of the work has really emphasized um, exploring high-end cognition or the nature of thinking. So being part of Project Zero and around all these colleagues who are interested in thinking has really informed my work and my own thinking. Um, and then finally, as part of a Project Zero initiative called The Good Project, I've been involved in some work that has been looking at ethics. So the work I'll talk about tonight is really, it it's really sits at the intersection of these three areas of interest of mine, ethics, thinking, and social context, and in this case, digital context. So then on a more personal note, I'm also a mom of two young girls, ages five and nine. And so, you know, my kids are really entering the digital realm. My nine-year-old is particularly active online. She's completely obsessed with Minecraft, and she's moved from not just playing Minecraft to really entering the YouTube community around the game. So she's been watching Minecraft videos, um, mainly created by 14-year-old boys for a long time, and now she's shifted into creating her own YouTube videos of herself in Minecraft, navigating those worlds, and actually that's a screenshot of one of her videos. She calls herself Horsecraft on YouTube. She has her own channel, Yell, her own channel now. So we are deep in to this. I, you know, the nine-year-old has really entered the digital public sphere, and Minecraft has been her hook for it. Not that she's not interested in some other aspects of the internet, but um, it's been really interesting for me to watch her and observe how she's navigating um, some situations that I think are frankly ethically tinged. Um, so I also have the hat of a parent um, when I think about these issues. Um, and so when I, you know, approach this topic for today, I'm, you know, I'm thinking like a sociologist, an education researcher, um, but also a parent. And sometimes I experience tensions between those hats and have to navigate and be much more aware of my own thinking and the messages that I'm sharing, particularly with my young daughters. So I just want to put that out on the table um, as context. Um, so then first I want to give you a quick overview of what I'd like to address in this session tonight. Um, I'd like to enter the problem space that I address in Disconnected by sharing two and a half stories that highlight and frame the areas of concern that I've written about. And the half is because two of the stories are connected with one another. And then I'll provide a bit of background and framing to give you a sense of the research I've done and why I've done this work. Then I'll share some substantive insights from the book about the broad theme of participation with a focus on how young people um, navigate speech situations on the web, how they think about speech online, the young people we interviewed in our studies. And this will lead me into a discussion of different ways of thinking about the moral and the ethical dimensions of online life, including thinking shortfalls. 
Then I'll turn to the puzzle of what this means for education and parenting and discuss a broad vision for developing more conscientious approaches to online life. And I'll point to some specific resources and tools that I think are helpful supports in, in approaching uh, developing a conscientious form of connectivity. I'll also call out two areas of my current research and education work that flow directly from the work that I did that I wrote about in Disconnected, um, two areas of work that I'm really excited about, so I, I hope you'll indulge me as I share a little bit about this current work um, because it's all connected. Um, so to get right to the heart of the matter, I'm going to open with two and a half stories that I think really call attention to the mixed potentials of social media and of this digital landscape that, they're, that we're all pretty much immersed in at this stage. Both of the examples are from a few years ago, but given recent events across the U.S., I think they're quite relevant, even poignant today. Story number one. In September 2011, it came to the attention of the NYPD that a group of New York City police officers had been creators and active participants in a Facebook group called No More West Indian American Day Detail. The apparent purpose of this public Facebook group to, was to complain about being assigned to patrol the West Indian American Day Parade, which is an annual event in Brooklyn. Posts on this public page referred to parade participants as savages and animals. Quotes included, drop a bomb and wipe them all out. Let them kill each other. The group had approximately 1,200 members. 60 active participants' names matched the, those of known police officers. Other participants were described as civilians and other city workers, including New York City firemen. The Facebook page came to light by lawyers who were investigating a case involving one of the officers who was a member of the group. As soon as the lawyer's discovery became known to the officers, the page was deleted. However, the lawyers had made a digital copy of the page and shared it with New York Times reporters. Ultimately, 17 police officers faced disciplinary action by the NYPD. So we live in a world in which public online spaces are leveraged and by non-anonymous or identifiable adults in ways that are astounding, in ways that make us ask, what were they thinking? We have a further example from Steubenville, Ohio, where in 2012, an intoxicated teen girl was sexually assaulted, assaulted by high school football players after passing out at a party. As the assaults were committed, several bystanders took photos and videos with their cell phones, which they shared on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and via text messaging. And a 12 and a half minute video in which onlookers joked about the assaults was posted on YouTube. So Steubenville is another example of how digital tools can be used in deeply dehumanizing ways. Yet this case also inspired an example of how participatory media can be used for good, specifically to push back on misogynist attitudes that contribute to rape and to a rape culture. In 2013, as the Steubenville rape trial unfolded, a University of Oregon college student named Samantha Stendhal was closely following the news reports about the trial. Outraged by the details emerging from the case, Stendhal was inspired to do something. She created a 26-second video entitled simply, A Needed Response. Pretty good, huh, for 26 seconds? So the video was posted on YouTube on March 22, 2013. It received over 700,000 views within two days of its posting. And at this point, it's been viewed over 10 million times, I think was the count on YouTube um, just now. Um, it also won a Peabody Award in 2013. So put together, I think these two and a half stories really point to the double-edged nature of the web. While networked media can be used to perpetuate 
racist and misogynist ideas, it can also be used in ways that call wider attention to the prevalence of those kinds of attitudes and behaviors. Indeed, such media arguably provide undeniable evidence of racism, of rape, and of rape culture. As sociologist Sarah Sabarai has pointed out, the digital record from Steubenville, from the Steubenville case, actually makes it difficult to argue that it was all just a misunderstanding. The videos, the photos, all of the evidence. Further, social media can be tapped to create and spread counter narratives, as Samantha Stendhal did. So my key question is, what are the impacts of such cases as these that model different uses of the web, hateful and harmful on the one hand, but then civic and justice-oriented, socially positive on the other hand. Importantly, how do young people think about cases such as these, and how are their own online choices informed by them? That's my key area of interest and concern. But I'm also curious about how the distinct qualities of digital content and environments really inform you thinking as they make everyday decisions about posting photos and status updates and other con content on the web. More specifically, how do young people attend to the potentially problematic dimensions of communicating in environments that are asynchronous and text-based, where content can be taken out of context and detached from its original owner and author? How do they navigate the interpretive gap, the distance between our intended meaning and the many interpretations people can take away from what we post online? How do they approach opportunities for anonymity and pseudonymity that are afforded at least in certain contexts on the web? How do they seek to bridge the arm's length quality of mediated communication, the distance between ourselves and others that the screen places before us? How do they think about the public or the potentially public nature of online content, the scalability of the internet, as Dana Boyd often calls it, and which audiences do they think about when they're thinking about audiences out there? As I'll discuss further, these kinds of questions, at the end of the day, are questions about moral and ethical sensitivity. I think notably, the NYPD and Steubenville cases suggest a lack of attention to many of the core qualities of digital content and context, especially the public or potentially public and persistent nature of online content. The cases also reflect a level of disinhibition that is likely supported by the distance or the arm's length nature of mediated communication. However, it's not my view that these qualities of the internet, scalability, persistence, public, scalable nature of the internet, um, are inherently problematic and inevitably lead to poor judgments, hate speech, or other negative forms of content. Again, they're double-edged. The affordances of network publics also invite youth and all of us to circulate powerful pro-social content to wide audiences. And other features, such as the asynchronous nature of communication, it's not all bad. It can leave us with time to reflect before we post or share something, if we choose to take that time, is the question. So another thing I think that is important to consider are what are our habits of connectivity? How do we approach these qualities? How reflective are we and our young people as they're connected to one another and, and when they're sharing content? Young people are often referred to as always on or constantly connected. Um, how reflective are they? Um, and what does it mean to be reflective about the ways in which you're participating in these spaces? Related to this, what is the pace of engagement online? How quickly or slowly are tweeting and texting unfolding? What else are we doing at the same time? How divided or focused is our attention? 
And, you know, are, are we connecting with people who are just like us? Are we in filter bubbles? Or are we really leveraging the potential of the web to be exposed to diverse perspectives, to really engage with diversity? So these are some of the um, habits of connectivity that we really need to keep in mind as we think about the nature of, of the internet and, you know, ha and its implications for moral and ethical life. So with some of these key sort of framing questions out on the table, I want to say a little bit about the work that we did um, as part of what we called the Good Play Project um, that formed the data for the book Disconnected. Um, um, so the study was carried out at Project Zero, um, and Howard Gardner and I were co-principal investigators in this work, and we had a great a fabulous team of researchers who were part of the interviewing process and the data analysis process. The project was funded by the MacArthur Foundation um, and involved both research, qualitative research, but also the development of educational research resources. So we partnered with two different organizations, Common Sense Media, um, Common Sense Education is here with us tonight, um, but also Project New Media Literacies, which is an organization developed by Henry Jenkins, who's at University of Southern California, and they do really terrific work on new media literacies. Um, and they were our partners for developing some educational research resources. Um, but let me say a word or two about the nature of the research we did. So over six or seven years, um, we conducted qualitative interviews with youth between the ages of 10 and 25, in-depth conversations with young people um, in which we ask them questions about their online experiences, um, trouble spots for them, areas of concern. We also presented them with hypo hypothetical dilemmas, ethically tinged situations that we wanted to understand their thinking about. And this formed the main core of our data, these interview transcripts. These were long conversations with every young person we met with, and over 100 youth. We talked with them twice, sat down for several hours at a time. Um, so we had a tremendous amount of data when we walked away from this stage of the research. We also spoke with adults, and specifically parents parents and teachers of middle school students because we really wanted to understand the extent to which young people's perspectives on these themes that we were interested in studying, were they all that different from how adults were approaching these same themes. So we sat down with adults as well and asked them similar questions about how they navigate their own online lives. We also asked them about the kinds of conversations they were having with young people about digital life and what sorts of messages they were prioritizing in those conversations. So that's a bit about the data. Um, our broad questions were really about how young people think about their online lives. So we were really looking at very closely and carefully at the nature of their thinking about different online situations. What kinds of considerations were guiding their choices when they were making decisions about sharing content in a social network, um, making a move or making a strategy within a game, uh, creating content that they would upload on YouTube. We looked at youth engaged in a wide variety of practices, and we were interested, what kinds of things were they thinking about as they were making decisions? And importantly, who did they feel responsible to as they were participating in networked publics? How did they respond to morally or ethically loaded situations? And are they, were they even cognizant when they had a moral or ethical dilemma on their hands? So how sensitive were they um, to the dilemmas that are often inherent features of participating in online context? So those were some of the broad um, research questions. In the book Disconnected, I focus on three topics that are, that are important and I believe are ethically tinged in new media environments. First, we looked at the nature of privacy. How do young people think about privacy, including their own privacy, and how they think about the privacy of, of others because they have the affordances of sharing content and information about other people with wide publics. So how do they think about that, um, and to what extent do they feel responsible for other people's privacy? 
property, how do young people regard and treat concepts like ownership and authorship, given the affordances to download and remix and appropriate content really easily? Those are features of digital contexts. And then we, we really investigated this broad topic of participation. What kinds of norms or codes of conduct guide young people's participation in online communities? Um, and we were particularly attentive to how they thought about norms and codes regarding speech on the web. Our research questions were really focused on youth, as, I, you know, as I'm revealing in the way I'm speaking about this. But as you'll hear a bit later in my talk, the story in the book is also a story about how adults, the adults in their lives, really think about these issues. It's a really important part of the story, um, and I can't say that enough. So tonight's focus will be on the broad, um, the broadest of fault lines participation. And we have a couple of guiding questions here. How do, how do young people engage and treat one another in online spaces? How do they respond to the conduct, the speech posted by other individuals? What sense of responsibility do they feel for others online? And what does that look like? What does it look like to be responsible to another individual or a set of individuals on the web? In the book, the main way I explore the ethics of participation is to look at how youth approach speech, as I mentioned. And in analyzing young people's narratives about speech on the web, I detected the presence of four distinct, I call them mindsets, but we can also think about them as attitudes or stances about the significance of speech online. The first stance that I want to talk about is play nice. This approach to online speech is aptly described by a 15-year-old named Trey. Trey says, I think of it as you talk to someone on Facebook as you would talk to them in person, and same thing online. You don't treat someone like a jerk just because you're behind the microphone. Some people use social network sites as an attack system just to attack people and then cower away because they can't do it in real life. So what Trey conveys here is a strong sensitivity to that arm's length quality of online life I mentioned earlier, the distance between ourselves and others when we communicate through technologies. And his principle about how he treats other people is a concerted effort to close that distance. As part of this, he uses a twist on the classic golden rule, do unto others online as you would do to them face to face. So Trey's moral principles for online interaction really mirror the ways in which he act, regards and treats people in offline spaces. Be kind, be respectful, in other words, play nice. So this mindset was fairly prevalent among the young people we interviewed, youth of all ages in our study, 10 to 25. They often shared what I referred to as moral concerns about their online postings, their online content in relation to their close friends, in relation to family members, people they knew well, their intimate relations. Um, indeed, pausing to reflect on other people's feelings, how they might respond to a piece of contact, is an, arguably an essential thinking routine in the digital age. We really should be making that move, especially given that distance that Trey noted, as well as the interpretive gap and other qualities of online spaces. At the same time, given that online speech can affect people we don't know, whose perspectives and feelings we might not be able to fully connect with, the play nice mindset, the sort of empathy that Trey was talking about is not entirely sufficient. So we also saw a way of thinking that was a bit broader. This is what we refer to as the it's a community mindset. And that considers implications for a wider community beyond the people one knows. So Trey says, I'm responsible to anyone on Facebook and my profile or whatever. If I have something bad or offensive on there, 
it affects everyone. So Trey conveys, you know, he's, he's really our ethical exemplar in this presentation. Um, he really conveys a, a sense of responsibility that pushes beyond his near and, nearest and dearest. He's pushing to this outer layer of individuals who he doesn't necessarily know. We're not just among friends online is something that he's recognizing. When we enter some of these spaces, we're in a community um, and one that is it's public or it's potentially public because the content you share in your friends-only network can quickly be shared beyond it. So implicit here is the idea that our actions in these spaces actually set norms. For example, both posting and ignoring cruel speech suggests that this kind of behavior, this kind of speech is fair game online. So reflecting on the broader effects of our speech is arguably also an essential practice, perhaps even more important than the play nice mindset, given the reality that our, our content can be posted beyond our nearest and dearest. However, beyond our ethical exemplar tray and some other youth, um, the mindset that it's a community was relatively rare among the young people we interviewed. Now this is not to say that young people did not think about the, eth the effects of their speech, that they were thoughtless. They did, but their thinking was typically focused on other concerns. The thinking was either focused on that small circumscribed group of intimate relations, or their thinking was sharply self-focused, focused on consequences. So here's the where the will I get into trouble mindset comes in. So this stance came up across our sample, across a variety of topics, as I'll talk about in a little bit. But it was especially vivid when we presented tweens, the 10 to 14 year olds we interviewed, with a hypothetical scenario about a hateful online group that they discovered a friend was involved in. The most re frequent reaction to this scenario was stated succinctly by Danielle. Somebody will find out and they'll get into trouble. And then we have Margot expressing a similar concern that if she talks about the hate group online, if she confronts her friends online, um, that teachers and parents could find out. So here's the possibility of unintended audiences, the scalability of digital content. Um, this is really what's engaged here with a primary concern for consequences, for getting into trouble. And as I'll speak to in a minute, this was quite a quite common way of thinking across the different topics we studied and by youth of all ages in our, in our study. And certainly this stance is not surprising. It's arguably natural, but it's troubling in cases where the thinking is quite singular, quite singularly focused on consequences, where it really didn't extend beyond um, the consequences to oneself. And this is a concern I bring up throughout the book and across different pieces of data. Yet perhaps even more worrying than the prevalence of self-focused thinking is the mindset that it's just the internet. Um, and this mindset or attitude was articulated in the most explicit way by a 19-year-old named John who was an avid participant in different online forums share the first thing that he says here. Most of the time when people see something online, their reaction is to laugh because, of the, because most of the stuff on the internet, you have no sway over at all. So you just laugh and move on. So John elaborates further as he talks about the prevailing sense of responsibility or lack thereof online. On the internet, each person feels 0.001% responsible. They're more like, I'm on the internet, there's really nothing I can do. I know nothing about this person, so I'm just going to stand back and be a casual observer. And the internet does turn a lot of interaction into casual observation, or at best, interested, but removed. So here John repre represents the belief that that distance that's an indisputable feature of our online interactions sharply reduces our sense of responsibility to others and our sense of agency 
toward troubling situations observed. In turn, he takes on a very, the casual observer stance, interested but removed. It speaks to a passive bystander disposition by, that by his account is normative in the online communities that he's engaging in. So although John's voice is the most detailed and articulate on this point, we saw shades of this attitude among many of the young people with whom we spoke. T typical comments included language like, the internet isn't real, and what happens online doesn't matter, so one shouldn't take it to heart. Related to this, the it's just a joke stance toward online cruelty and even hate speech came up fairly often. So I raised these mindsets um, and I chose these quotes about online participation for a couple of different reasons. One, I think they're important data points about the different ways in which the young people we interviewed are approaching online speech. But second, there are echoes here about the broader findings about how youth approach the other topics we studied, how they make decisions about appropriating online content, text, music, video how they think about privacy in network publics. So across these topics, we observed that most of the time, youth framed these issues in really self-focused or consequence-driven ways. What might happen to me as a result of posting this photo, grabbing this text from Wikipedia for a school assignment? Will I get fired from a job, denied admission to a college, and experience another negative personal consequence as a result of my tweet or photo? And are the rewards of doing what I want to do, posting what I want to post, worth the risk? So this was the calculus that we saw. Now again, this is very natural thinking. It's understandable um, that young people will be considering consequences and striving to take care of themselves, and certainly we, we want them to be doing this. We want them to be alert to some of the consequences, but we also want to see broader ways of thinking engaged. So we also looked at the extent to which we, um, the extent to which young people were engaging in what we call moral thinking. Um, and moral thinking aligned with Howard Gardner's conception of neighborly morality is really focusing on known others, those intimate relations that I talked about when I shared the quote from Trey. Friends, family, um, close acquaintances. This involves showing empathy towards these strong ties, using moral principles like the golden rule or the twist on the golden rule that Trey shared. Um, and across topics, we observed a good amount of this moral thinking. The kids with whom we spoke were really adept at considering how their friends might respond um, to particular forms of content posted on the web. But again, as I mentioned earlier, moral thinking is important, but it's not sufficient for participating in network publics, where our actions and the things that we share can be shared beyond, not just with our strong ties, but to our weak ties as well, and even broader publics. So a big part of our work was looking carefully at the transcripts of our interviews with young people and looking for evidence of what we call ethical thinking. Um, and we define ethical thinking as a capacity to think in a more abstract or disinterested way about the effects of one's actions for a broader community or public. Um, this involves alertness to how one's conduct can set norms and set an example for individuals. So beyond Trey's it's a community approach to speech, we saw a couple of further examples of ethical thinking that are really inspiring. For example, um, a young gamer we spoke with who was um, an avid participant in World of Warcraft, I believe is, was his game of choice, spent many, many hours involved in this community, was really invested um, in playing the game, invested in his small guild or community within the game. 
would talk to us about the nature of unfair play in World of Warcraft. And he spoke about it not just in terms of the potential rewards for individuals or you know, for himself and for his guild, but he also talked about and criticized unfair play because of its broader impact on the game economy. So this was a fabulous example of ethical thinking, thinking in the gaming space. Another young person we spoke with talked about and was actually involved in Wikipedia as a Wikipedian, meaning um, he actually contributed content to Wikipedia, um, and felt a strong sense of responsibility. If he saw misinformation on Wikipedia, he was really inspired to change it because he wondered about how that information could be taken as truth by different individuals, individuals who were more or less educated, younger or older. Um, so he was really doing that careful thinking about how Wikipedia could have certain kinds of impacts. So despite these impressive examples, ethical thinking was rare as, com as compared with other modes of thinking. Now certainly, if we think about the age ranges of the young people we interviewed, we interviewed youth between the ages of 10 and 25. So the folks that we refer to as tweens, the 10 to 14 year olds, are still developing the capacity to think ethically, to think in an abstract and disinterested fashion about the broader effects of their actions. But teens and young adults should have that capacity, and, and indeed all of, them sh all of them showed us that they could do ethical thinking at least once or a couple of times in their interview, but it wasn't, it wasn't a kind of thinking that they prioritized, and it certainly wasn't um, a routine habit of mind or approach. So this points to a relevant insight um, from the literature on moral, the literatures on thinking dispositions and moral psychology that I want to highlight here. The distinction between having a capacity, having an ability or a skill to think in a particular way, moral thinking, critical thinking, any kind of higher order thinking, having the capacity versus having the sensitivity or inclination to engage in that kind of thinking. Research shows that high level thinking is often less a matter of skill, it's dispositional. It's linked more strongly to our alertness to opportunity to engage in that thinking, our sensitivity, um, but also our inclination, the degree to which we're motivated to do that kind of deep and careful thinking. So related to this and holding that distinction in mind, um, in Disconnected, I emphasize how young people's approaches to online life are often marked by two different thinking shortfalls. The first are blind spots, and I define blind spots as failures to be alert to or aware of the moral or ethical dimensions of online situations. So here I'm inspired by um, a book written by Max Bazerman and Carolyn Tenbrunsel called Blind Spots. It's, it's not a book about the internet, but it's a book about behavioral ethics um, and the tendency of individuals to favor um, concerns for themselves and not necessarily think more broadly. And this isn't just about young people, it's also about adults. It's, you know, a series of findings um, from studies that Bazerman and other folks in behavioral ethics have done over many years. So blind spots is a reality. Um, I was interested in how these blind spots are evinced in network publics. So an example of a blind spot online might be posting a video on YouTube without considering the possible concerns of the people who are featured in it, maybe a group of friends who you have videoed um, on the playground or having a fight, or I mean, it could be relatively benign, but doing that sort of consideration um, for whether they want to be on YouTube, whether they're okay with that, or about how the content in the video, if it, especially if it's something that's more mature, might, be, might affect unknown viewers of, or be misinterpreted in a way that's harmful. So that's an example of a, a couple of examples of blind spots, failures to be alert to some of the moral or ethical features of online situations. Now the second thinking shortfall um, that I saw evidence for was something I refer to as a disconnect, and that's where the moral or ethical features of a situation are recognized, but then dismissed 
in favor of other priorities. So for example, in relation to sarcastic or more explicitly hurtful online speech, one might recognize the likelihood of offending someone, but then dismiss it as less important than the need to vent or the opportunity to amuse other online friends by making fun of someone, for example. So that's an example of a disconnect, a recognition that there may be some harm associated with a choice, but then a, dis a distancing of oneself from that reality. So considering that distinction I mentioned a moment ago, blind spots can be seen as failures or shortfalls of sensitivity, of alertness. Disconnects can be seen as failures of inclination or of moral motivation. But failures of a sense of agency are also wrapped up in the inclination or disinclination piece. If young people feel they can't do anything about entrenched norms that indicate negative speech is just a joke or other troubling situations they observe in line, they're certainly going to be disinclined to try to address these issues. So agency is a really important piece of the puzzle that we need to be looking at as well. I think there are some really important questions we need to be asking about these blind spots and disconnects. First of all, how they're shaped by the qualities of digital technologies and environments that I spoke about, like the distance between ourselves and others online, the fact that we operate from behind a screen, our habits of use, if we're often multitasking or moving very quickly from one activity, one page, one app to another, the norms that exist, especially in young people's social networks or other online communities, and I think the importance of the peer context for young people as they're growing up. The, the centrality of peers and peer life makes those norms really important and significant. So those inform blind spots and disconnect. But a big thing I want to underscore is the final piece um, about the supports and the messages that young people receive from adults. That's another factor that is really important for us to attend to as we think about some of these thinking shortfalls. So in relation to this, first we need to consider the impact of incidental role models, mentors, or anti-mentors that young people become exposed to as they participate on the web. We, you know, as parents and teachers, we may not even be aware of who these individuals are and the kinds of things that they're doing online that young people are often an audience for. These are individuals who, through their own actions, are modeling different uses of the web. The NYPD using Facebook in order to engage in racist speech. That's a particularly dramatic case. I think the more routine everyday examples, for example, the norms that we see in the comment section of uh, news sites may be even more influential, but we have to be looking carefully at some of those examples, those incidental role models or anti-mentors that may be influencing young people's approaches to the web. But then we also have the more purposeful mentors, the parents, the teachers, and other key adults in young people's lives. And our findings here are a really important part of the story I'm trying to tell in this book. Nearly all of the adults we interviewed also displayed ethical blind spots, both in their online choices and in the advice that they gave to young people. When we asked young people about their conversations with adults about the internet, the top messages they reported hearing were number one, about stranger danger, or number two, be careful what you post so that you won't get into trouble those consequence-oriented messages. So conversations about kindness, about community, about citizenship, these conversations were sometimes mentioned, but they were typically overwhelmed by these self-focused, consequence-oriented conversations. So overall, the story I tell in this book, as I describe in the introduction, is really a glass-half-empty story. 
Um, while I did find really impressive examples of ethical sensitivity, and I showed you some of them tonight, I showed you Trey, Trey's It's a Community Approach and his Play Nice perspective. Overall in my book, in this book, the emphasis is on what's missing, what youth and adults are blind to, what youth and adults are disconnected from, and my concern that our thinking about the internet is often too individual-centered, myopic, and short-sighted. So in the concluding chapter, I talk about what we might do to cultivate more mindful or ethically sensitive approaches to the web. I describe conscientious connectivity as mindfulness of the implications of what we do, not just for people we know, but also for unknown others and for the integrity of different online communities. And I argue that being a conscientious connector or conscientious digital citizen um, involves two elements. First, it requires the skill to think about the ethical dimensions of our choices. But we also need to be disposed or inclined to engage with moral or ethical concerns. So I want to take each of these pieces in turn. So first, um, ethical thinking skills. I'm not going to engage in a long discussion of these, of these three distinct skills. I talk about them a bit in the book. I also um, reference them in the work that we did with Project New Media Literacies, where we created educational resource, resources around digital life that, that explicitly a, are aimed at scaffolding these skills. Um, but the skill of complex perspective taking is arguably important, considering how one's actions can be in interpreted by or can influence multiple distant stakeholders involved in a particular situation, considering how a tweet might be interpreted by different readers who come at it with different interests or concerns. Roles and responsibilities, thinking, considering how, how our different roles in our lives um, imply different responsibilities and how we manage those on the web. When an Instagram photo of a young people, uh, of a young people, of a, shows a youth or an adult wearing a sweatshirt or a cap with their school name on it. Um, what they are revealing in that photo, what they're doing in that photo can reflect back on the community. That's sort of the gist of roles and responsibilities thinking. Um, interestingly, I think on Twitter, we see some adults managing this really difficult uh, roles and responsibilities or context collapsed issue by indicating their professional affiliation. They'll look at someone's Twitter profile, indicate they work for XYZ organization, but they also have the phrase, tweets are mine, to indicate that they're not representing their organization when they're posting on Twitter. Finally, community thinking is really thinking about how our, our activities and the things that we do set norms and can influence the integrity of communities. So these skills are really important, but as I've noted, and I think is a strong emphasis of what I'm trying to share here tonight, being an ethical or conscientious citizen involves more than just skill, it's dispositional. We need to have the disposition to be aware of and to foreground ethical concerns. Um, so echoing my earlier references to the different aspects of a thinking disposition um, and talking about the moral psychology literatures, I think about ethical dispositions as, as having a couple of key ingredients. First is ethical sensitivity. We need to be sensitive to or alert to moral or ethical issues and dilemmas. We need to be aware that dilemmas are on our hands or they might be on our hands. One way, I think, um, of cultivating greater ethical sensitivity is through routine exploration of online situations, as well as cases we hear about in the news. So I've shared some cases tonight. Thinking carefully about these cases and exploring different perspectives on them, I think, is one way of scaffolding greater sensitivity to situations going forward. But once we recognize dilemmas are, are at hand, we, needed, we need to be motivated to really wrestle with them and consider our responsibilities and whether we're fulfilling the responsibilities that we have. Um, 
addressing the motivation or the inclination question, I think, is more complicated, ultimately. I mean, it's really a moral identity in issue. If you, know, if, if you don't care um, about other individuals, then it's, you know, it's difficult to become motivated to really um, engage with and reflect on some of these moral situations. But I would argue that most kids and adults do care. What I worry about is that the pace of digital life and the norms that exist in some online networks can sometimes cause their moral concerns to fade into the background. They may not be as alert to some of the things that they do care about. So how can we encourage youth and all of us to bring those, um, our values and our responsibilities to the foreground? And I think one avenue is to make routine reflection on responsibilities a regular um, aspect of young people's lives and of all of our lives. But finally, an ethical disposition needs to be fueled by a sense of agency, a sense that we have sway over online situations, you know, unlike our our, uh, our friend John here. And um, supporting ethical agency requires that we first explore particular action steps, consider ways to confront troubling online acts. So turning to quickly to the how of supporting these situations. Um, in terms of thinking through dilemmas, I've shared a couple of powerful cases tonight of online misdeeds specifically. Um, and for better or, or worse, the news um, is often giving us a fresh supply of new cases um, for us to consider and think through with young people. Uh, last year, a controversy ensued when the Colbert Report uh, shared a tweet that taken out of context from what had happened on the program was basically racist. Um, so this is an example of a, a further case for discussion. Uh, a week or two ago, the New York Times explored another digital misfire by a young woman named Justine Sacco, um, who used Twitter to, um, to make a comment that was racist. Um, and so I think being alert to some of these cases that emerge you know, on a routine basis in the news media and, and leveraging them to have conversations about, uh, about some of the dynamics at play there, some of the thinking behind these moves is, is a powerful mechanism for raising ethical sens sensitivity. Um, but we also should encourage youth to think not just about these dramatic situations, but also their everyday routine decisions, their decision points on the apps um, and technologies that they're using, and inviting them to engage different perspectives on the things that they're choosing to do on those apps. How might your younger cousin or sibling uh, respond to this photo? if she were to see it, your teacher, your mom, someone from a different culture, race, or religion. So doing that kind of considering different perspectives. Um, in short, I think conversations about online cases such as these can be considered ethics spotting exercises, an opportunity to look out for and spot different ethical considerations or concerns. And I think we have a couple of really um, powerful practical resources, so Common Sense Media um, has a fabulous digital literacy and citizenship curriculum that in many uh, cases in includes lessons that draw on scenarios that are realistic, that raise dilemmas, and provide thoughtful prompts for discussion. Um, a colleague of mine is um, the director of a project called the Family Dinner Project, um, and it's, it's actually now, now based, recently based at Project Zero, um, and they provide valuable supports for making family dinner a really generative space to discuss meaningful and important topics. So, um, and Common Sense Media has recently partnered with Family Dinner to create a series of conversation starters focused on digital ethics so that these kinds of conversations can be, um, can be at your dinner table.
So thinking through dilemmas. Um, but we also have reflecting on responsibilities. Um, it's a critical step to consider the responsibility question. Another fabulous tool for this is Common Sense Media's Rings of Responsibility, which I think just visually um, encourage us to think about the different layers of rings of responsibility. I think used as a reflection tool, it can make us more alert to the kind of thinking we're engaging in and maybe nudge one's thinking beyond that core of the self to outer layers. Um, and there are nice resonances here with the concept of one's universe of observation, or of obligation, um, that my friends at Facing History often talk about and work into some of their educational materials. A second avenue for supporting this kind of reflection is to provide opportunities for youth and all of us to reflect on our core values. So my colleagues on the Good Project have a tool on our website. Um, they also have a deck of cards. Cards, um, that's a value sorting tool. It gives you an opportunity to think through what are your core values and prioritize them in different ways. So finally, ethical agency. Um, as I noted, I think this is a really central piece. Feeling that one has sway or can do something about some of the troubling situations one observes online, that one can take responsibility, not just reflect on their responsibilities, but take responsibility when the situation and when one's conscience requires it is extremely important. And I think there are a couple of different ways we can support ethical agency. Number one is that we can inspire young people with all of the terrific examples of youth who use the web for a larger cause, for a civic or social justice issue. Um, so I shared with you the video created by Samantha Stendhal, um, but this slide is also peppered with other examples of young people using new media to further a cause. For example, um, a group of young people created a change.org petition to address the Steubenville case in a different way, from a different angle, an effort to, to work through high school football coaches um, to educate football players about sexual assault, to work on the prevention side of things. The use of Twitter to engage in discussions um, about Ferguson and other important matters. Uh, the use of Facebook profile photos to show support for a social cause like marriage equality. I think these are all terrific examples um, that show and really model really socially positive uses of the web. But beyond inspiring youth um, with these examples of individuals who might you know, seem different from them, it might seem unapproachable, I think we need to invite um, and encourage youth to envision for themselves how they might take action online, to explore possible action steps, to consider implications, and prepare to do something. Um, and I think this work really increasingly needs to involve exploring productive avenues to respond to online hate, to online uh, bullying and cruelty. I think too often, from what we've heard in our research and in other places, the advice of ignore, scroll past it, and walk away just doesn't cut it. We need to we need to create some supports to, um, for youth to respond respectfully back to disrespectful discourse and, um, and figure out some strategies that endow with them with a sense of agency. So that's the agency point that, um, that I think is critically important. And as I turn to a close, I want to take a moment or two to mention a couple of areas of my current work that I said at the beginning. Um, really connect to the ideas that I wrote about in Disconnected, especially the ideas about ethical agency. So the first project, um, the first project um, is part of a research network called Youth and Participatory Politics, where we're interviewing young people who are using uh, web-based tools and strategies to engage with civic and political life. So many of the examples on the ethical agency slide were really 
drawn from that work or I, they came across my attention because of that research that we've been doing. But my particular interest now, and we're just, we've just gone back into the field and are interviewing um, civic youth, is on how young people navigate online dialogue about civic and political issues because the discourse can often very quickly take an uncivil turn online. So I'm curious to know and understand better the kinds of strategies young people are using to stay in the conversation, to continue and maybe you know, shifted into more productive avenues. One thing that we've seen among some civic youth is a quieting over time because they feel unprepared to manage when conversations go uncivil. So I'm looking to learn from youth who are staying in the conversation. So that's a big area of the work that I'm doing now. And we're also um, creating some educational materials around doing civics in a digital age, partnering with Facing History and Ourselves on that piece. The second project that's occupying my attention right now is, uh, is really about how we can use online context to foster meaningful and respectful cross-cultural exchange. So the great potential of the internet is that we can be exposed to diverse perspectives, but the reality is we often flock together. We're often in filter bubbles and echo chambers. So this is one effort um, to push beyond that a little bit. The project's called Out of Eden Learn, um, and it's affiliated with a epic walk that a journalist is taking. Um, but really, it's an online community designed to give youth a social media-like experience that intentionally puts them in communities with individuals, other young people in different parts of the world, young people from different cultural backgrounds. Um, the activities in our community are really designed to encourage young people to slow down and engage in careful reflection about their identities, to exchange stories um, with young people, to listen carefully to young people from other cultures and understand their perspectives, and to look at how their own lives relate to or are part of a larger human story. And this project has given me an opportunity to take the ideas from my book in a new direction and think about, from the perspective of designing an online community, how can I take these ideas about conscientious connectivity and and actually encourage them in an online space. So two ways we've been doing that. One is uh, we've recently developed a set of community guidelines that we think are really important. And the goal of these guidelines is to, is to really hit that sweet spot between authentic and respectful engagement. Being yourself, but also being respectful and engaging deeply with other people. Um, I think our hope is that these principles and ideas will have legs that move beyond this particular community and experience. Um, they're likely applicable offline too. My colleague argues that they provide an excellent set of guidelines for first dates. So there's that. The other thing we've done, we've done in Out of Eden Learn is we've really taken more seriously um, the issue of how we engage in commenting with one another. And so we've looked to design or, or nudge youth to be much more intentional about the way they're commenting um, in particular networks. What moves they're making? Are they asking a question? Are they making a connection? Um, and we think that um, encouraging more attention to what you're doing as you're commenting is a way of promoting more reflective and potentially meaningful exchanges. So um, we encourage these moves to youth in our community and we've actually also built them into the design um, of the comment boxes. If you look across the bottom there, you see those symbols um, that are just slight nudges that remind participants in our platform of different ways in which they can connect with other youth or comment on the work um, of youth in our community. So we're really excited about some of this work and it's interesting to go from being a researcher to being on the design side of things. Um, the uptake of things like this, it's not clear yet. It's really an empirical question. We've just built these pieces into the Out of Eden Learn community. So as a researcher, I'm curious to look more closely at the uptake of them and how youth are responding to these design features. Um, but I wanna 
Thank you for indulging me for a few minutes longer so I could share um, some of these new fronts of my work. And now I'd like to say thank you and turn um, to a discussion and hear what kinds of questions um, and thoughts are on your minds. <laughs>